Have you had the opportunity to download our app? If not, then now's the time. Check out our free app and access multiple connections to some of the many great ministries that are happening at Generations Church. This user-friendly app features several channels, including hundreds of our teaching podcasts and many of our sermon series that can be heard on the Word channel. Lots of wonderful music is ready to be enjoyed with our worship channel, and encouraging stories are hearable on the channel simply called Testimonies. Inspiring video clips can be watched via the video channel, and our current announcements are viewable on our commercials channel. We even have one we call Guidelines for communicating some of our key values. Our app also has links to our website and Facebook page, as well as to Pastor's blog and online giving. Check it out and enjoy all that is available for you today. We're going on a verse-by-verse journey through the book of Genesis. We're calling Jesus and Genesis the roots of the gospel. And our journey has brought us, today is Sunday number 6, only to verse 15 of Genesis chapter 2. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it, to till and guard it, to work the land and protect it. The word there for keep is shamar. It means to protect, to guard. We'll find out by the last next chapter whether or not he did a good job. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. So this man is, is an adult living in paradise, who's never had it hard, never been told no, never known anything but paradise, the Garden of Eden, for goodness sake. So God puts this one test in the garden, a tree, and he says, don't touch it. If you do, there's consequences. The day you eat of it, you will surely die. Verse 18, the Lord God said it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. Uh, This is ironic. The Hebrew word for alone is the word bad or bad. It's not good that the man be bad. (laughs) I found that quite humorous. I will make him a helper comparable to him. The word there for helper is not inferior. It's, um, It's the Hebrew word azer. And it's only used in the Old Testament in the context of important and powerful acts of rescue and support. It's in the Old Testament 21 times. Twice it is used here in the context of the first woman. Three times it is used of people helping or failing to help render aid in life-threatening situations. But 16 of the 21 times it is used in reference to God himself as a helper. Without exception, an azer or a helper is a vital and powerful kind of help. What was it Jesus promised about the Holy Spirit that he would give us another helper? Another implies that there's been a helper first, and then here's another one, right? You can't have a, another piece of chocolate unless you've had one first, right? How can I have molasses when I haven't had any molasses? So a helper like Jesus came, and he's the Holy Spirit. He is Jesus' Spirit sent to us. All right? So here the woman is given as a helper, so it's not a put down. It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him, and then he doesn't do it. Out of the ground... The Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. Up to this point, he's been called man. Now he's called Adam. The translators made that decision. It's the same Hebrew word, Adam. God formed Adam out of the dust of ground, and now here Adam is naming the animals. He brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. So he gave... Adam gave names to all cattle, to the birds of the air, and to every beast of the field. But to Adam there was not found a helper comparable to him. 
So he gave names not just to every species. You know, there's an owl that screeches. I'm going to call it screech owl. There's a bird that pecks on wood. I'm going to call it a woodpecker. All right. Now, every living creature got a name. So there was a Billy Bob in there. You know, maybe there was Billy Bob the horse, Billy Bob the whale. I don't know. But every creature had a name. So this was work. You ever categorize stuff? You ever have to file things? It's work. And he had to do it all by himself. And in doing it, I'm sure he noticed there were male and female. Male and female. And if he had a mirror to look in, I'm all alone. So God underlines the fact with this task that he's given him. It was not found a helper comparable to him. Verse 21, the Lord God caused a deep sleep. Can you say anesthesia? <laughs> to fall on Adam and he slept and he took one of his ribs. Can you say surgery? <laughs> took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and he brought her to the man. Now why a rib? Well, it's from his side. So the woman was made from his side, not from his foot, not from the top of his head, but from his side, someone comparable to him, someone like him. And also, wounded ribs heal like no other bones do. You know that? I have a friend that was in a bad motorcycle wreck, tore up his rib cage. And I said, what do you do? He says, they can't do anything. But ribs, let's say there's a gap between your ribs, you know, they can fill in that space over time and heal together and become whole. Or if there's an overlap, you know, one rib's on top of another one, they can come together and become stronger and grow the length it needs to grow. So this was probably the most uh, intelligent thing that a man could afford to give up. And what a deal, a rib for a wife? Wow. The Lord God caused a deep sleep, all right, he brought her to the woman, and Adam said, here's the world's first love song, this is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called, whoa, man, <laughs> because she was taken out of man. The first man looked at the first woman and said, whoa, man, man with the womb. Male saw a female. The Hebrew word there for man is ish, and for woman is isha. So ish saw someone like himself and said, isha. Therefore, verse 24, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. So human history, as the Bible tells it, begins with the creation of man, it continues with the creation of woman, and they're brought together in a wedding. God is their father, but he's also Adam's father-in-law now, and he presents the bride to the first groom, and he fully receives her unconditionally as bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. It was before the song was written, but he liked what he saw, he liked who she was, and he could have sang, don't go changing to try to please me. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Men, if you're still living at the house, it's not a good time to get married. You got to get on your own two feet. And women, don't look for a man that doesn't have a job. This man had a job. He was categorizing creation naming animals, tending and guarding a garden. He was busy. So if he's unemployed, give him some space. How can he get a job if you're around him all the time? Who's going to hire him with a girl on his arm? <laughs> yeah, I need you, but uh, I don't need her, and uh, so go elsewhere. So anyway, let him get a job. Let him grow up. Give him some space. You'll like the results. Verse 25, and they were both naked. <gasps> the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. No sin, no guilt, just pure innocence and wonderful joy here with the first man and first woman. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that your word would speak to us today in such a way 
that our lives would be changed. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd like to speak to you today on the subject of God's original intent for mankind, the original purpose. What is our purpose? So to find the original intent, we go to the blueprint, Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, God speaks, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every living thing that creeps on the earth. So the first man and first woman were the first cowboys. Over the cattle, right? So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Two genders, saints. That's it. There's no confusion. The animal kingdom understands it. Did you hear about the little boy asked his mama if he could smoke? She said no. He said, why? She says, because you're only five. Well, can I have keys to the car to go to the store and buy some candy cigarettes? No. Why? Because you're only five. Well, can I start swimming now without my floaties? No. Why? Because you're only five. Well, can I take hormone treatments so I can change my gender? Oh, yes, you know what's best. Let's call the doctor. That's happening in our culture, saints. Then God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over everything that moves on the earth. God's original intent for mankind, as we just read it, includes him being created in God's image, him being created to be like God, in God's likeness. The temptation in the next chapter is to tempt them to think they weren't like God, You'll be like God if you eat of this fruit, the serpent said. They already were like God. Isn't it crazy how we're so easily deceived to think that the grass is greener on the other side of the fence? There's a story of brothers that become legendary. They sold their farm to go look for diamonds. And guess what? They found diamonds on their farm. And they named the company after them, their mistake. Man was created to have dominion, to exercise authority in creation. Man was created as male and female. Man is an all-encompassing word. Mankind, humanity, speaks of both men and women. Man was created for fruitfulness, created to multiply, to prosper, to have children and grandchildren and beyond, and and to cause gardens to grow and to run snakes off. <laughs> we read this last Sunday, Genesis 2, verse 7. Then the Lord God formed the man, that's Adam, from the dust of the ground, that's Adama. The men were just dirt clods. Man, Adam means red, so he made him from some red dirt and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul, a living being, through the breath of life. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. Now, I've I, I got to refer to this. We had a previous president, who was told by his pastor that a baby is not a baby until the breath of life comes and use this text to do it. So he passed legislation to make sure, you know, abortion is protected because he believed his pastor told him that you're not a human being, you don't become a human being until the breath of life comes. Hello, have you heard of the navel cord, you dingbat? If mama stops breathing, the baby stops breathing. And now they pass legislation where a baby can be on the operating table breathing and still not deemed as a human unless the mama wants him or her to be human. 
All right, moving right on. God's original intent for mankind was how he formed him. He formed him as a male first by God. He was first placed in a garden. Ladies, he had a job first. Verse 15, the Lord God took the man, put him in the garden to tend and keep it, to guard it, protect it, to till it and work it. And the Lord God commanded the man, of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Why? God was their source of knowledge. He was their source of information. So this tree was like a doorway to go elsewhere for your information, to not look to God for good and evil, to, to begin to live by your opinion and not by God's. And that cuts us off from the wisdom of God and opens us up to death. He was first given work to do in the garden, paradise, to garden, to garden it and guard it be gardening and be guarding. He was first commanded what not to do. That was the first command, and he was first warned of consequences right there at the start. We just read this earlier. God said, it's not good that a man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him, an azer, a powerful aid in his life. Out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field over bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. So every living creature, every creature he did this to, but there was no one comparable to him. No one could fill the need. So God saw that Adam needed someone. Now, ladies, this is not a good reason to get married just because someone's needy, but it's a good reason to let God work on him and get him ready. He was tasked with naming animals, and of course, you know, maybe he gave the boy animals boy names, the girl animals the girl names, and there he stands by himself, Adam. And then God made the woman from the dirt, no, from the man, from superior stuff. Watch this. Why did God use Adam's rib to create Eve? The book of Genesis relates how God created Eve. The Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep, and while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man and brought her to the man. The phrase for one of his ribs could be translated a part of his side, but almost every English translation specifies the part as a rib. Earlier, in making Adam, God used the dust of the ground to form his body and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. But in making Eve, God did not go back to the dust. He used one of Adam's ribs to form the woman. When she was brought to Adam, the man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. God used Adam's rib to form Eve. He used existing tissue and did not start from scratch to show that Adam and Eve were of the same substance. She was made from the same stuff and was a bearer of God's image and likeness, just as Adam was. The woman, made of Adam's rib, was designed to be a companion and helper suitable for Adam. Eve, formed from a physical part of Adam, was truly his complement, an integral part of who he was. As such, she was a perfect companion. Why did God use Adam's rib? Interestingly, ribs have amazing regenerative powers. Portions of rib bone and cartilage removed in bone graft surgery will regrow in a few months' time, as long as the rib perichondrium is left intact. This means that Adam's loss of a rib was only temporary. He did not have to go through the rest of his life with an incomplete skeletal system. When God brought Eve to Adam, they were united in marriage. The woman in Genesis 2.22 is called Adam's wife in verse 24. The pattern for marriage, the first social institution, was thus established by God in Eden. The manner of Eve's creation is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. The unity of a married couple and the one flesh principle are based on the fact that God used one of Adam's ribs to make a woman. God's use of one of Adam's ribs to make Eve is a reminder that woman was created to be beside man. 
Together, the man and woman complement one another in marriage, and in Christ, they are heirs together of the grace of life. Got questions? The Bible has answers, and we'll help you find them. Okay, we begin by stating the obvious, and then we move into the not so obvious. So it's obvious from the text that Adam needed someone. It's obvious that he was naming animals. It's obvious that God brought, made the woman from the man, and then she was brought to the man by God. And his response was one as total acceptance. She was a gift from God to him. This is God's will for husbands, that you receive your wife as God's gift. And I wonder how the woman felt, you know? He wakes up and she's got, she's, you know, there in God, and then God presents her as a gift. So she sees the man as a blessing from God. And so I believe that's God's will for wives. This is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. This is, this is an ownership like I have a dog or I have a Ford, but I have a wife who is bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. Paul wrote in Ephesians 5, a man who loves his wife loves himself. This is, this is oneness, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. She should be called, whoa, man, because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave and cleave. Leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife, they became one flesh. They shall become one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Now, there's a couple principles here I want to bear out. One is complete acceptance of your mate and leaving your parents and being joined your so if you go to your parents for advice, you both need to do it together or you both need to be in agreement to do it. Otherwise, parents unintentionally could be so in discord. Just a little point there. Um, notice that they're called to become one flesh. Now, God's original intention is that they multiply, right? So we know that refers to children, but really children is addition. You know, if that and I had two kids, now we're four, that was two, two, two becomes, becomes four. God added two kids to us. But now we've got multiplication. There's, you know, in-laws and there's children. So the family has grown from a family of four to eight. Boom. Um, so in becoming one, this also involves multiplication, but it involves being whole. Integrity is a whole number. An integer is a whole number. One can be an integer, but half isn't an integer. It's, it's a whole half, but it's not a whole number. And in getting married, if you marry someone to complete you rather than to be like you, then you're going to be a drainer. You're going to drain the life out of that person. Think of multiplication. You, you get together, you're going to multiply. So one times one equals one. You can become one. But if you're not a whole person, if you're looking for someone to complete you, someone to, I have a friend that, you know, is not taking his garbage out. And uh, another friend kind of got on his case, said, man, you need to be a good steward. He said, yeah, this is why I need a wife. Whoa. It may not be that extreme, but it's that kind of thing. I need somebody to do this or that for me. Um, life is about giving. And so in multiplication, there's total commitment of both of you. Well, if you're only half a person and they're, they're a whole person and they think they're going to rescue you, it's not going to work because one times one half equals one half. Marriage is not a 50-50 proposition because 0 0.50 times 0 0.50 equals 0.25. You tear each other down less than what you were before you got married. So become whole in the Savior. Embrace your singleness. Let God heal your broken heart. Become whole. Never submit to a relationship on the rebound. 
then you can have a healthy, whole relationship where you're both are wholeheartedly contributing to your marriage. All right, I've confused you. I'm not going to go on any further, but I think I got the point across. Marriage is instituted for one husband and one wife. This is God's plan for man. Now, it's not long in the Old Testament before we're going to see polygamy take place, and there's nothing but trouble that comes out of it. It's a mess. It's a mess. And so maybe your early days, you didn't start out just right, but you're married now, and maybe it's not the first time you're married. It's for life. One wife, one husband for life. So be committed to the relationship you're in now. Amen? God's original intent for mankind includes his original intent for marriage. What does Jesus have to do with this? I thought this is Jesus in Genesis, and Pastor, you're already off on a rabbit trail talking about marriage. You just can't leave it alone. It was just too obvious. Well, Jesus has everything to do with marriage. Think of his first miracle. Marriage points to his first miracle. A couple was going to be embarrassed and ashamed of five to seven day celebration on the first day, runs out of wine. This is terrible. The Lord performs a miracle at the encouragement of his mama, and he creates over 120 gallons, maybe 180 gallons of fine wine, enough to last them for a few days. Marriage points to what he said in Mark 10, 6 through 9, which is also said in Matthew 19. Listen to this. Haven't you read, he said, that at the beginning the Creator made them male and female and said, for this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one. Therefore, what God has joined together, let man not separate. God joins us. He doesn't want us separated because we become one. And divorce just tears up our hearts, destroys the faith of our children. God hates divorce. And Malachi says, because it covers us with violence. Tough deal. But that's the past. In Christ, we have redemption, right? Never use his redemption as a reason to do wrong because he'll allow you to suffer the consequences. Marriage points to Jesus himself in Ephesians 5, verse 25. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. Remember when he was put to sleep, killed on the cross? What's the last thing they did to him? They pierced his side, and out of his side came sin-washing blood and water. Part of our redemption. So his bride's full payment was made with the giving of his life that included a wound in his side. He did this, verse 27, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any, any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves him Self. Why would you want to put dirt into your drinking water or intentionally soil your clothing? When you hurt your wife, it's going to come back on you. It just is, right? Happy wife, happy. Marriage points, marriage points to our union with him. We're looking forward in the future to the great wedding where the church is joined to the Lamb who is our groom. Let us be glad, Revelation 19 and 7, and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. So we're in that process now of getting ready for this grand wedding day when the bride of Christ 
is joined in holy union for eternity with Christ our Savior. What is your marriage pointing to? What is our marriage pointing to? What is my marriage pointing to? Is it pointing to Christ? Well, I know it should be, but I married the wrong person. You know, that's one lie the devil couldn't tell Adam and his wife. He couldn't? There was nobody else. Watch this. She loves me. She loves me now. I love you. She loves me. You gotta let the flower decide. You don't get to tell me. No, I decide. But you accept this sunflower. Always and forever. So I think some people look at their marriage like it is an episode of The Bachelor or Bachelorette show, you know, where you're like handing a rose to yes. somebody to like whittle down the pool and decide, you know, who you're gonna marry. And then they have, they never actually get married, it seems like. But, well, no, not really. I, but I think some people in their marriage, they have this fear like, what if I married the wrong person? What if I gave the rose to the wrong lady? Or what if, what if I accepted the rose from the wrong guy? And now yeah. I'm trapped in this marriage that I was never supposed to be in. And this this really haunts the thoughts of a lot of people. Yes. And we just, we want to address this head on because that mindset, that mindset will destroy your marriage. It's not that you married the wrong person, but that mindset of thinking you did could destroy your marriage. Yes, because if we keep on doubting who we married, then we start kind of opening that window to fantasizing about being with someone else. Because yeah. if we're thinking, did I marry the wrong person? Then that, that goes to show like we might also be thinking the only natural next thought would be, maybe I should have married this other person that I met before my spouse, or maybe that person that I'm supposed to marry is still out there. Maybe it's the guy that I work with that I find very easy to talk to. Maybe it's that girl next door that I just think is always so nice. And it, it really opens us up to a place that we, we think is innocent and we think we're just like, oh, we're just thinking about it, it's not dangerous, but our thoughts become our actions. And so we've got to grab hold of these thoughts and shut them down as soon as we possibly can because it's dangerous territory. Because the truth is, the person that you married became the right person that day that you said oh. I do to them. And you have to you have to be committed to your to the person that you married and remember that they are the right person, but it takes work. Just because you're having a hard time doesn't mean you didn't marry the right person. It takes work, it takes intentionality, it takes getting help when we're getting through a hard time. It doesn't mean we married the wrong person. It just means we might need to reach out for some help. And there's so much help out there. That's why we do what we do. There's so much help at marriagetoday.com. There's so much help going to a Christian counselor. So the bottom line is don't give up. Don't give up. It's not about compatibility, it's about commitment. It's yes. about the covenant you made. And if you'll stay committed to that covenant, God's got amazing things planned for you and the person you marry. So marrying the right person is the question to ask before you get married. But once you cross that line and you are married, you're together, you're a couple, being the right person is the question to ask. Becoming the right person, because you can only change you. View yourself as a thermostat. If, if you don't like the temperature in your marriage, you make some changes to you as a thermostat, and that will affect responses. Does that make sense? So God's original intent for marriage is oneness. Bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. Years ago, this is just one of the times that that and I went to counseling, but years ago we thought there were some demons involved in our problems. So we went to a deliverance minister. And after listening to us, he gave us a secular book. A little bit disappointed. It's easy to blame the devil for everything, isn't it? If it can only be that easy. It's a book by John Gray. Uh, uh, I don't know that I would take it to the bank because he's been divorced now since he wrote the book, but called Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus. The purpose in them recommending this book was it, 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 with a humorous way, he reveals the differences between men and women. I mean, we're just different, right? Sameness is lameness. It's, we're both the same, then one of us is unnecessary, right? And so um, little, little tips like cave time. Men need cave time. If they come home from work, give him some space. 
but men don't take the whole evening to be in your room by yourself. But 20, 30 minutes, that's it. And then you got to come out and be interactive because you're more than just the provider in the home. Can I get an amen? So give your husband space when he comes home from work so he can lay down, close his eyes for 30 minutes. And then, men, you got to get up and be interactive with your family so you get space. That little adjustment made a whole world of difference. But the big difference was made right there in that meeting. It was like a deliverance. We had shared all our stuff. There we were, vulnerable, all our, all our weaknesses on the table, all our disappointments, all our anxieties on the table. And he led us through understanding this text, kind of where this sermon came from today, of unconditional total acceptance of each other. You know, Jesus said, if you receive a prophet in the name of a prophet, you receive a prophet's reward, right? Right? If you receive a righteous man in the name of a righteous man, you receive a righteous man's reward. You ever gone to a family reunion and you don't really feel received because people still see you through the eyes of being a little kid? You really can't be yourself. Well, unless husbands and wives completely, totally, 100% accept and receive one another as God's perfect gift, warts and all, they cannot really be all that they're called to be because there's a lid on their potential. And so he had us embrace each other as, and verbalize, I receive you as God's perfect gift to me. I'm sure that felt like she was embracing a cactus. But what she saw was she needed my weaknesses in her life to develop her character. She needed my strengths in her life to make up for her weaknesses and vice versa, my characters develop when I learn mercy and compassion for someone that's not weak, but, it, you know, many times it's a person's strengths that annoy us. You know what attracts you to a person becomes what annoys you? Just one example. Somebody's really faithful. Isn't that an awesome trait? You know what the other side of the coin of faithfulness is? Stubbornness. That wasn't a that nice issue, but anyway. Fully, I, I receive you as God's perfect gift, like the first couple. God's perfect gift to me, I receive you. This needs to be included in wedding vows, really. But I receive you as God's perfect gift to me. I'd like to do that this morning. Can, can the couples in the room stand? I'm going to lead you in this exercise. And men, we're going to go first, all right? Come on up. Here. Oh, we've done it since then, yeah. We've done it several times. Yeah, all right. All right, face each other, look each other in the eyes, and men, tell your woman, your Isha, I receive you, in your own words, I receive you as God's perfect gift to me, and then embrace her with all your heart. I receive you as God's perfect gift to me. I receive you as my wife has perfect gift to me. Okay, refrain from embracing. All right, ladies, do the same thing. Look, look your man in the eyes and tell him, I receive you, and really do it. I receive you as God's perfect gift to me, and then give him a big hug. I receive you as God's perfect gift to me. All right. All right, let's all stand as the praise team comes forward. We're going to celebrate our union with the, with the great groom, who's our example. Ephesians 5, 13, uh, 15 through 33. Powerful marriage information. Read it today. Who will read it today? All right? Read it today for yourself, not for your spouse. Ephesians 5, 15 through 33. 
Men, where it speaks to husbands, read that for yourself and apply it. Where it speaks to wives, let that be between, be between them and God. Be like father, if you deal with your daughter, but deal with me, all right? And women, when you read that, where it applies to wives, apply it to yourself. Where it applies to husbands, let it be between them and God. Father, deal with your son. Can we do that? Amen. Let's worship the Lord. Like a ring on solid gold, like a vow that is tested, like a covenant of old, your love is enduring through the winter rain and beyond the horizon. Mercy for today, faithful you have been. Faithful you will be, you pledge yourself to me, and that's why I sing your praises. Ever be on my knees, ever be on my lips, so praise you. Ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, so praise you. Ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Ever be on my lips, ever be on my 
person and he found him and put him on the case. In 30 minutes he was back with the first man and first woman, arm and arm. Peter said, Sherlock, how did you find him so quickly? There's millions of people up here. Sherlock said, very elementary, my dear Simon. They're the only two people up here without belly buttons. Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace in your home, in your marriage, on your job. Peace that's not based on compromise, but peace that's based on his conquest over our selfish hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Go get them, Tigers. 